On this episode, we talk with the Maryland Secretary of Transportation about access to bridges. We look at the trail system in Anne Arundel County. We meet the Maryland Director of Bicycle and Pedestrian Access. We learn about the Purple Line in suburban Maryland. Finally, we meet a pair of advocates in Silver Spring, Maryland. Stay tuned. We're talking with John Parcari, who's Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. Where are we standing and what happened here today? This is, uh, we're standing uh, on the second span of the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, which has an 11th and 12th lane uh, that are built for transit over the long term. It also has a great hiker-biker trail connection right behind us here that will connect uh, the Mount Vernon Trail, the Potomac Heritage Trail, and Oxen Hill. Uh, so it's, a, it's the first time that we've been able to connect those trails together. It will also relieve the single biggest traffic bottleneck in the metropolitan area. Now, what's happened in the decades since the original Woodrow Wilson Bridge was built that didn't have a, a pedestrian and bicycle facility and now when you include it in a bridge like this? Well, it's a, it's a great question because at one point uh, when the project was in cost trouble, when the cost estimates were higher than anticipated, uh, we had people trying to value engineer the trail connection out. Uh, and uh, to their credit, the governors of uh, Maryland and Virginia refused to do that. Uh, and as a, as a matter of course, all of our projects now have those kind of connections wherever we can possibly make them. And in fact, Governor O'Malley signed a bill the other day uh, for the transportation authority facilities in Maryland that when we replace the Governor Nice Bridge, for example, uh, that it will have uh, uh, hiker-biker facilities. A big step forward. What, uh, what difference is it going to make for non-motorized travel around the state when when you uh, when you get these connections in across the state's rivers think about it uh, you could live in Alexandria work at National Harbor uh, and never get in your car or you could live in National Harbor and uh, do the opposite uh, it gives you those choices uh, the trails that are being built around the state and we're working very hard to, to link them into interconnected networks uh, are an incredible asset and uh, in addition to the recreational benefits, they provide a legitimate commuter alternative uh, for a lot of our citizens. We're in Annapolis, Maryland, talking with Dave Dion. What's your connection with trails here in the Annapolis area? Well, John, I work for Anne Arundel County Department of Recreation and Parks. I'm the chief of trails and natural areas for the county. What, what, what sort of trails do you have in, in the county? Oh, we have an extensive series of trails. We have 40 miles of trail in operation, including the Baltimore and Annapolis BWI trail around the airport. We're building the WBNA, and about six miles of that trail are currently open. And then we're also building the Broadneck Trail, the South Shore Trail, and we're building some uh, trails off into the communities to connect to that spine system of trails. Trails, you have uh, you know the the trail itself that people can use, right. but. What, what do you do to, to add amenities to the trails to make them a little more interesting for people? Oh, that's a great question. My job is to build and operate the trail system, and we created a uh, 501c3 corporation called the Friends of Anne Arundel County Trails. Their job is to promote, protect, and enhance the trail system. So we have the 40 miles of trail in operation. We have another 40 miles that are in development, construction. and But the Friends' job as they are enhancing the trails, they will do projects like uh, take a little piece of land that is park property and they'll build bandstands and gardens and all kinds of things along the route. And then um, people will be able to cycle along and have a nice rest area where they can hear a concert or they can sit and enjoy the kind of the natural beauty. All of those amenities are maintained by citizens in the community. They're all adopted by people. So my staff, as we're building and operating, we're able to do all the basic functions like keep the trail safe, keep the trail clean, patrol the trail, and give visitors the services they need. And then all those great amenities are built right into the trail by the community. My management philosophy is build the trail in the community and then build the community into the trail. And you have something you call the Planet Walk. What's that all about? Planet Walk is a scale model of our solar system and it's one of the Friends Enhancement Projects. It's four and a half miles. It's designed to be a half-day field trip for school kids. They'll get dropped off at either the Sun Station or at Pluto, which is still a planet, John, and they will walk the system, and they'll see a scale model of the solar system over that four and a half miles. Every step a school 
school child takes through the solar or uh, through the planet walk, every 24 inch step is a 26,000 mile trip through the solar system. And they'll, they'll engage all the planets in order. Each one will have its own little plaza. NASA is developing some um, signs, interpretive signs to teach them. There's a big piece of artwork that goes up uh, interpreting the planet and they, they end up with all kinds of great information. They can download a lesson plan and the teachers can teach about the planets uh, beforehand and then they go walk the planet walk and they answer their questions as they go along. People can use these trails to get around the neighborhood or around the county. How do they fit into some of the bigger trail systems that are out there? Well, uh, I know that you're aware of the East Coast Greenway and the American Discovery Trail, two national millennium trails that are developing. American Discovery Trail goes from basically San Francisco to Cape Henlope in Delaware. East Coast Greenway goes from Calais, Maine to Key West, Florida. And they intersect right here in this park in Annapolis, Maryland. And um, the East Coast Greenway and the American Discovery Trail have both overlaid their names onto our county trail system here. And that's the way they're developing their trails by partnering with local trail organizations and trail building entities so that they can um, uh, you know, help enhance the trail system. They can actually fill in gap areas where trail is missing. A large national organization like East Coast Greenway can go and partner with the trail advocates in the area and say this will become part of a major national trail system and it'll have quality of life impacts, economic impacts, it's going to have impacts on your environment. Um, it's going to do all kinds of great things for your community. So um, our trail system here is part of those national developing trail systems. Do you find that being part of a national system uh, uh, in, in, you know, in enhances what is you know, more or less a local trail? Yes, it does, because when we go looking for funding for construction, a, a, a local trail uh, manager or local trail agency uh, can go and sit down and say, we're going to become part of the East Coast Greenway. And suddenly the little three mile trail section that they're talking about takes on national importance. It becomes a real big deal and the city council gets it and the mayor gets it or the county executive gets it. Here in Anne Arundel County, we've been very blessed. Our politicians got it right away. And every year they have funded money for trail construction and we continually are adding sections of trail uh, along the way. We try to go where we're welcome first and then we fill in those gap areas. We put in the bridges or the things that have to, to, have to, to happen to connect uh, two distinct sections. And then, and the great thing is, not only do the politicians get it, the citizens get it too. You just mentioned that you know, the trails are for recreation, but they're also vital for transportation. People are able to leave the minivan at home and go to the post office, go shopping, go visit, uh, you know, have lunch with a girlfriend or something. And they can, they can walk or they can ride a bike and they can get their exercise while they're just engaged in all the activities that are gonna take place during the day. We're at the places where the, those two major trails are going to cross. Correct. What are you going to do to comm commemorate that? Well, right up the hill here, we're building a ranger station. Some of my staff will be permanently stationed here, and they'll patrol the trails right out of this park. This is Jonas Green Park. And then we're also, we have a plaza built up there, and our friends organization has been talking about uh, creating a piece of sculpture with a local Maryland artist that will commemorate the intersection of those two national trails. We're in Bethesda, Maryland, talking with Michael Jackson, who's the Maryland Director of Bicycle and Pedestrian Access. What does the Director of Bicycle and Pedestrian Access do? Well, John, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I basically handle bicycle and pedestrian policy for the Maryland Department of Transportation. Um, and probably more succinctly, I'd like to think of myself as a problem solver. And how would your position deal with uh, uh, the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator that all the states have? Maryland is special. Um, each state has a bicycle pedestrian coordinator that was created by the ICE-T legislation back in 1992. Um, in Maryland, that position resides within our state highway administration. Um, however, in 2000, there was legislation passed that created an additional position Director of Bicycle and Pedestrian Access. Um, it's my understanding that bicycle advocates thought that the bicycle pedestrian coordinator position was not high enough in the bureaucracy to make the types of changes in the department's policy that the cycling community felt should be done. So a director level position was created, and I um, 
am the first occupant of that position. And you've been running around uh, different places this morning. What was going on earlier today? Um, today is uh, Bike to Work Day. Governor O'Malley had uh, issued a proclamation declaring this as Bike to Work Day in Maryland. And actually, I started here in Bethesda for their Bike to Work Day event. I think there's a, there are a number of locations throughout the, the state, um, Baltimore, Annapolis, the D.C. metro area. And from here, after saying a few words about what the state was doing, I went over to College Park and did the same thing at their event. On the way over um, to College Park, I was listening to National Public Radio, and on their um, program, they mentioned that this was Bike to Work Day. Um, and they had an interview with Leah Sharm, who is the bicycle coordinator for the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. And she mentioned that um, there are rising um, cons um, rates of obesity, rising rates of climate, um, of global warming, and rising weights of rates of fuel consumption and that bicycling is an elegant solution to all three uh, policies. So anyway, I thought it was nice that they gave bicycle to, bicycle to work national publicity today. So what, uh, just what happens on, on Bike to Work uh, Day other than keeping you busy running back and forth between the locations? You know, sometimes I fear that Bike to Work Day is a little bit like um, St. Patrick's Day where everyone's Irish for a day. But um, no, uh, Bike to Work Day is intended to be a celebration of bicycle commuting, an encouragement of bicycling commuting. And while we have um, elected officials and uh, policymakers come out on this day to pay homage to those who bike commute, uh, we also hope that it's an opportunity to encourage people to bicycle throughout the year and not just on Bike to Work Day. And someone who's is new to bicycle commuting, maybe a little unsure of themselves out on the road on a bicycle, what resources are available for them? Uh, there are quite a number of resources available for the, um, the new bicyclist, the novice bicyclist, the person who wants to step up from riding on a trail to actually considering um, commuting to work by bicycle. Um, the Washington Area Bicyclist Association has confident um, cycling courses. The Maryland Department of Transportation puts out a number of bicycle safety materials um, for both children and adults. We have a safe cycling um, in Maryland guidebook. And most recently, we have put out a video called um, Competence and Confidence, um, done entirely in Maryland. And I just happen to have a copy with me. So what, the, what, what would someone watching that video learn? Um, basically, they would learn um, hopefully, at the title, um, how to become a competent cyclist if you're riding on the roadway or a trail, and to have the confidence, I guess is the best word, um, to be able to do so. Um, they would learn um, basically um, how to fit themselves to a bicycle. A bicycle is like an article of clothing. It should fit you properly. We would also, um, they would also learn um, about the importance of safety, starting off with a helmet and moving on to other, um, other items such as um, lighting if they're cycling at night. Um, then we go on to how to avoid common dangers. We talk about um, what are things that cyclists have to worry about, uh, such as intersections. Um, riding with the flow of traffic, um, making themselves predictable, um, anticipating uh, movements by motorists that might, um, uh, could cause some problems, making an assumption that they're invisible until they've made eye contact with a motorist. Uh, we go on from there and talk about trail riding. Um, we're standing right now by the Capitol Crescent Trail, a very popular commuting and recreational facility which the state is encouraging the construction of more such facilities. However, people feel that because they don't get, because cars don't share this facility that they can let their guard down. But we also talk about trail considerations, how to watch out for pedestrians, um, 
how to avoid collisions with pedestrians, um, how to warn people when you're passing them so that they, uh, they're not surprised. Uh, we also talk about special considerations such as um, crossing complex free freeway ramps. We give some t tips to talk about night riding um, and what, you sh what type of equipment you should have. And then we also go beyond uh, bicycle safety issues to such things about locking your bicycles. Um, and one of the ironies in this film, uh, we had some filming done right here in Bethesda uh, on dealing with intersections. And right across the street from where we are, um, we did a segment on locking your bicycle properly. Um, we talk about um, options such as bicycle lockers that some employers provide um, for um, long-term storage of bicycles. And we also tell people about opportunities they have in the state of Maryland to bring their bicycles on board public transit on um, DC's metro system, for example, or on, um, or on um, Baltimore subway and light rail lines. There are rules and, and some restrictions on there, but that is an opportunity for people to extend their journeys um, by mirroring their trips with transit. And um, in the Washington area, all the buses have, transit buses have bike racks on them. We are in the process of putting on those racks on buses that serve the Baltimore metropolitan area, and we expect that project to be complete by the fall. So that is the type of information in a nutshell people will get in the 16 minutes of watching this video. We're in Silver Spring, Maryland, talking with Beverly Swain Staley, who's Deputy Secretary for the Maryland Department of Transportation. What is the Purple Line? Uh, the Purple Line will be the uh, newest addition, we hope, to the uh, Washington Metro uh, in Maryland. It will link uh, Bethesda to New Carrollton, and most importantly, will link Prince George's County and Montgomery County. Uh, and significant areas such as Bethesda, Silver Spring, and Tacoma Park to uh, College Park and the University of Maryland. So it will be a great uh, economic development project, uh, promote transit-oriented development, and uh, bring 68,000 riders to transit every day. What's the significance of having that many riders on a, a new system? Well, obviously, uh, it will uh, help relieve some of the congestion that we have in the area, but I think most importantly, uh, it will allow the region to continue to grow and it will provide access for people in this region uh, to get to jobs uh, and to uh, other activities that they need to get to in this area. Uh, many folks now uh, in some of the area take th three to four buses to get to work every day. It will eliminate uh, the need to do that. Uh, and as I said, uh, very importantly, be linking uh, the two counties in a way that we've never been able to do that before. How are all those riders going to get to the station so they can take the new light rail line? Well, uh, many of the riders uh, are already in uh, the urban areas, such as Bethesda, Silver Spring, Tacoma Park. Uh, so obviously we'd hope that they would be able to, uh, to walk. Uh, we obviously will uh, continue to have uh, bus routes. Uh, Wamata, of course, uh, will be Metro, will be linked to the new Purple Line. Mark will also, all three lines of Mark, will be linked to the Purple Line. Uh, and again, we think uh, with the new legislation the governor just signed on transit-oriented development, uh, we hope that that is a major role as we're developing the Purple Line, that we're also uh, developing uh, these uh, areas around the transit stations to accommodate much of the growth that we want to see in this region. Where is the Purple Line in the process it has to go through? Uh, and the Purple Line is in the uh, uh, what's called the DEIS process, the Draft Environmental Impact Statement, which uh, has to be prepared. Uh, we hope to submit that uh, to the uh, FTA this fall. Uh, so we've been going through the uh, public hearing process uh, to do that, uh, open houses that we've been calling them, uh, to uh, get all the information. We need to make sure that we have the, the best ridership uh, so that when we present uh, our case to the FTA, we will make the best case possible. Uh, because we do need to compete. Our project will compete with many other projects around the country uh, for limited federal funds. So we want to be in the best possible situation to do that. So that's what we're working on now. And then, of course, we will continue to have uh, uh, review the process, uh, evaluate uh, the, uh, the alignments that come out as a result of the DEIS. Uh, and then once uh, we have uh, the evaluations that we need by the FTA, we hope to move forward uh, to the federal government uh, to try to get the, the money that we're going to need to fund this project for construction.
it's great to be here this morning. And as you know, uh, Governor O'Malley is a uh, tremendous supporter of transit and has made expanding transit throughout the state uh, one of his top priorities. Uh, we are committed to moving uh, our projects uh, to the next generation. And that includes, of course, the $100 million to move forward with the engineering for the Purple Line uh, that we're here to celebrate this morning. Uh, this is part of an expansion that includes expansion uh, for the Washington Metro and for the MARC system. Uh, and of course, that's very relevant to the Purple Line because that will be the newest transit line that will really connect uh, all of these systems and connect the western and uh, uh, eastern uh, parts of our state, really, with the metropolitan area. Uh, Governor O'Malley has uh, committed to the $50 million a year match that's required for WMATA for the dedicated funding. Uh, and also, uh, of course, we've announced the uh, largest MARC expansion ever, a $200 million expansion. Uh, so all of these initiatives are very important to improving uh, uh, transit opportunities here in the Washington region, which of course are more critical uh, than ever. We're in Silver Spring, Maryland, talk with Mike and Wendy Linda. Hello. What's uh, downtown Silver Spring like for pedestrians? For pedestrians, it is very dangerous. The reason why it is so dangerous is that when we're crossing in the crosswalk, I wave to people say, so they can see me without any question. I've gotten the bird, four letter words, I'm afraid for my life. And there are points where as I, it is where I can actually cross in the middle of the street and in fact, it can be safer. There, there are people are, I feel I'm terrified. There are people being childish, rude. They're doing something totally unethical because I'm crossing to get to my destination. But when I'm crossing and I'm noticing people using their cell phone, talking, reading a newspaper and driving at the same time, that is aggressive driving that is totally just out there, I'm sorry, or unethical, offensive. And this is not the way I remember people who would be driving in, let's say, 1970, 1980. It's totally different. So what's, what's your experience been like? It's very dangerous. It's very um, hurtful when people are not watching where the heck they're going. They don't know the cross streets that if they're not knowing where their cross streets are. Um, when they're driving, they should be looking at a map when across the street or when they're driving, they should know where they're going before they go. They should look at maps on the internet or something else before they go, things like that. Then you say you don't think it was this bad? Uh, in 1970, in no. Because for one thing, in 1970s or 80s, cell phones were not the main course of T talking to someone or conducting business in 1970, 1980. But today, I'm noticing a lot of people who are, as they're driving, they are on their cell phone conducting business, paying attention to something else other than driving. That's a significant difference. Also, when I've made sure that they see me, they seem to wave back, and what happens is they don't care. They say they go, they have an aggressive look as they're driving. They're pretty much implying that I'm wrong for crossing in the crosswalk. Excuse me. So yeah, I, I just don't like, I don't, I don't understand that. This is not how I was raised. I remember my father used to complain about people in another state who'd be driving through here and it was driving him nuts. That was nothing compared to the way people were driving today. So as we cross, there is, in some areas it says on the no turn on red. There's a, uh, the green light, yellow light, and uh, green light in arrow that spe specifies when you're turning. People are ignoring that, and when the green light is on, they'll just go anyway. And they're ignoring the uh, light that uh, determines if you can turn or not. And when we're crossing and we're about, let's see, 40% in the crosswalk, cars are still going. And we've had situations where the cars are turning, I think it's their left or right, yeah, yeah it's, their, it's their right or left. I'm specifying, hello, do you see me? One, two, three, seven, nine cars or even 11 cars have gone through. And we were not able to cross in the crosswalk. 
and I don't understand that either. Now, what, uh, what, what, what have you tried to, to do to try to get somebody to, to do something about this? We've called the police. We have called someone that we know on the politician side. We, have, we even went to um, a, a small newspaper to see if they would do something. We've called someone at CBS. They themselves did an uh, article about two years ago. And the uh, person that was doing the actual interview got, had to get pulled back by the camera, the person do, doing the camera. The reason why is that the car, there was a car that was going by and did not care and uh, nearly hit that, per that lady. So that's the problem I'm having. Why is it that when I understand the law to be that pedestrians have the right of way and it's turning to a situation where cars think that they have the right of way over a pedestrian? What, uh, what message would you give to the drivers out there if you could well, talk to them? I'll explain. I do this. Hello, see me? You see me? Um, I make sure that they see me before I even cross. I look left, right. I make sure it is impossible for them to say they don't see me. The, the message I'm sending is that, hi, I need to cross. Uh, that's my right. They have a right as well. But the rights of the pedestrian, especially someone who is disabled, a person who also has, who's a senior citizen, and car, the, the drivers are ignoring that. They don't seem to care. That is something that I'm concerned about. I don't like the fact that when I was just looking at the um, crosswalk, people were driving and pedestrians were crossing and the cars aren't watching where the pedestrians are going. They never have and they never, I don't think they never will. Unless they put a sign out there stating the fact that pedestrians are, have the right to cross on the crosswalk and do not allow the drivers to cr drive at that time, that would be fine. They should change it back to that because I understand that from my husband when I was growing up, that's what they had to do. But now they don't and basically everything's screwed up now because of it. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.